So let me uh, welcome everyone to the Four Futures for Mountain Farmland Symposium. Uh, I am your host, Ian Booth, with Sustainable Now. I'm a graduate of Guilford College. Guilford is a Quaker college. And Guilford set me on fire for social responsibility. And I said actually to a former president of Warren Wilson that they ruined me for life. They left me with a passion to make a difference in the world, especially in the area of sustainability. And with um, a commitment to get in the game. The goal of Sustainable Now is to establish Western North Carolina as a sustainability capital and potentially as an example of what a climate-friendly community would actually look like. Can you imagine the opportunity that it would be to Western North Carolina if we were to be a climate capital? How do we create a climate-friendly community? The topic that we're going to be looking at today uh, has to do with rethinking sustainability and land use in Western North Carolina. The pictures that you're seeing here are of a place called the Old Coggins Farm. By way of full disclosure, I have lived on the Old Coggins Farm for 10 years. And uh, my commitment around sustainability and around my relationship to the farm have come together in the form of creating an event and a setting in which we could think through what is the highest and best possibility for our relationship with our land and especially with our farmland. So let's start with what does sustainability actually mean? One definition is that it means that it is capable of being, something is capable of being sustained. It basically says, we can keep this up. And it's based on the idea that more is better. This is sustainable. We can do, we can do more of this. Under this model of sustainability, usually the mechanism that we use to determine whether or not something is really going to be sustainable is whether or not it's economically feasible. Typically under this model, we have an idea. And then we go looking for a place to make our idea happen. It starts with the idea, now I'm going to go find a place to have my idea happen. It's basically all about me and my idea. Okay. That model starts with the idea, and then you find the place. And we call this rugged individualism, me and my idea. Under this model, there is also an incentive to internalize the benefits and externalize the costs. In other words, we'll keep as many, many of the benefits as possible over here, and we'll put as many of the costs as possible over there. We'll externalize them. That tends to be one of the attributes of this rugged individualism model. But in the 1980s, we began to notice that this rugged individualism was having a pretty profound impact on the environment, on other people, on communities, and on the very life support system itself aboard what some people call Spaceship Earth. Bucky Fuller coined that term, Spaceship Earth. And as we all know, a spaceship does not have infinite resources. This Spaceship Earth does not have infinite resources. It has abundant resources, but not infinite. So we began to realize that we had to rethink our relationship with land and place, atmosphere, water, the whole biosphere in the context of a new way of thinking. Out of this new definition, it was no longer all about me and my dream. It was about stewardship. It was about all life on earth. It was about starting with place. Start with place where we are right now. Not with the idea. Let's start with place. Instead of more is better, like the old model, the new model says more is more. Better is better. 
And that's a pretty profound shift. And it uses a system of indicators, social indicators, environmental indicators, economic and quality of life indicators, to think through our decisions. So we're working with a much wider range of parameters to evaluate, is this a good idea? Is, is what I'm about to do a good idea based on this range of parameters? It includes things like our ecological footprint. And that basically asks, what is the real world impact on the living environment of the actions that I'm about to take? It includes carrying capacity. How much human activity can we have in this place without causing harm from habitat loss, sprawl, overpopulation, and so forth? Remember, the new definition says sustainability is living and working without causing harm to the environment, to other people, or to future generations. Well, that's a pretty tall order. So you have to factor in things like carrying capacity and ecological footprint. You also think about things like closed loop systems where the waste from one activity is the feedstock for another activity, just like in nature. Sustainability also emphasizes relocalizing, especially relocalizing our food supply. As you think about climate impact, we have to radically reduce the relationship between transportation calories and food calories. So relocalizing the food supply is one of the keys to creating a climate-friendly community. And of course, relocating our food supply means that we have to preserve and protect all the farmland we possibly can. And do that in a way that factors in social equity and resource e equilibrium and that sort of thing. So we'll be looking at those attributes of sustainability in uh, much closer detail in Lalita's presentation. Uh, and she'll be presenting three different segments and uh, her master's degree in public policy from the Harvard Kennedy School really shows up in the presentations that she'll be giving here later today. So we've talked about sustainable. Let's think about green. We hear that term a lot. Green this, green that. So what does green really mean? Green means to reduce the overall impact. Green means that a technology or a technique has less impact than an older technology, okay? And the improvement or the difference is usually demonstrated in a measurable comparison. This window loses 40% less energy than that window. This water heater is 60% more efficient than that water heater, okay? So it's a comparison that we can quantify how much better one technology is than the other. Does that mean that green is sustainable? No. It means that it has less overall impact. Sustainable means no negative overall impact, okay? Big difference. So green has less impact. Sustainable has no negative impact. So when you hear somebody say that something is sustainable, ask yourself, can we really do that without causing harm to the environment, to other people, or to future generations? If the answer is no, then the technology is not really sustainable. It's green. And if somebody continues to call something sustainable that doesn't rise, to that level, then I submit that the emperor is not wearing any clothes. <laughs> okay, So that's a distinction that uh, as we move forward as a community, we'll become more and more attuned to the use of the word sustainable. If we're going to create a truly sustainable community, we have to raise our level of literacy around that. What if we took a completely new approach to sustainability? Right now, we are, in effect, losing ground. That's a great metaphor. We're losing ground figuratively, and we're losing ground literally. Everything that happens, happens in a place, right? 
No matter what we're doing, we're doing it from a place. We put the physical world into three categories, people, places, and things. Place is central to all life on the planet. What if we started there? What if we started by thinking about place first? How can we protect this place in perpetuity and create the highest outcome for the owner, for the community, and for all life on the planet? What if we started with that question? Real sustainability is place-based. It asks, what is my relationship here with my yard, with my neighborhood, with my, with my community, with my county? How do we sustain this? That's the first question we ask in a truly sustainable community. Once again, sustainability means living and working in a way that meets today's needs without causing harm to the environment, to other people, or to future generations. So let's take a quick look at our history uh, with the land. The first Native Americans did not own land. They lived on the land. They used and even worshiped the land and everything that lived here, but they did not own it. When the early Europeans came over, uh, they already had developed a system called enclosure. A king or a conqueror declared this to be his or hers, then granted it in large parcels to powerful, loyal allies for gold or political favors or for whatever reason. And the dividing and subdividing has gone on from there. Some of the land was used to grow food, some of the land to grow houses, some to grow jobs and innovation. Some was saved to grow minds and spirits, and some to protect other living creatures. Rugged individualism, as we enclose ever smaller parcels, then commoditize those new parcels and extract wealth in the process. A system of deeds and transfers that enable us to buy or inherit land as property, private property, my property. One definition that I came across said, an owner of property has the right to consume, alter, share, redefine, rent, mortgage, sell, exchange, transfer, give away, or destroy it, or to exclude others from doing these things. 30 years ago in this room, I met Wendell Berry. And Wendell Berry has been a source of extraordinary inspiration for me ever since. I've seen him in this room a number of times, and that's exactly why I wanted to have the symposium in this room. So we were talking about this rugged individualism model of how we relate to the land. Here's what Wendell Berry has to say about it in his book, The Way of Ignorance. He says, the tragic version of rugged individualism is in the presumptive right of individuals to do as they please, as if there were no God, no legitimate government, no community, no neighbors, and no posterity. This is most frequently understood as the right to do whatever one pleases with one's property. One's property, according to this formulation, is one's own absolutely. Rugged individualism of this kind has cost us dearly. When property rights become absolute, they are invariably destructive. For then they are used to justify not only the abuse of things of permanent value for the temporary benefit of legal owners, but also for the appropriation and abuse of things to which the would-be owners have no rights at all, but which can belong only to the public or to the entire community of living creatures, the atmosphere, the water cycle, the wilderness, the ecosystem, the possibility of life. So from that perspective, it provides another window on this process of enclosure that we have systematized with subdividing into ever smaller, deedable parcels and structures 
And that process now drives a large segment of our economy, which emphasizes growth as the path forward. In the meantime, we still have no mechanism for thinking through land use in the context of sustainability. That's why we're here today, to create a curriculum, a video series that can help our community and other communities think through land use in the context of sustainability. So the title of this, uh, of this symposium is Four Futures for Mountain Farmland, and we'll uh, continue uh, the presentations with two more uh, keynote addresses, uh, and uh, then we'll move into thinking through those four futures, those futures being agriculture, development, innovation, and conservation. And our speakers will be bringing each of those subjects to life. This is uh, an effort, a grassroots effort, to really move forward the conversation. How do we create a sustainable future and how we do it in a relationship to our land, in relationship to our farmland? So thank you so much, and we'll be uh, setting up for the next speaker, uh, who will be uh, Lalita Booth. And uh, so thank you. We'll be moving to the next presenter in just a moment.